First Peter chapter one, I'll be reading verses one and two. Around the table this morning, I, it's my practice Sunday morning just to read the text that I'll be preaching from. And I read these first two verses and, and uh, it was asked, is that all? And part of our reading of this has a sense of that. This is, it's like introduction. It identifies who's writing and to whom he's writing. And you might think, well, is that all? But I want you to listen to these two verses and I want you to listen for, for our triune God for the work of salvation that is given to us, I want you to to see the depth of these two verses. And uh, I hope to to, to draw you in to a really profound introduction that Peter gives to his letter. So listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied. In anticipation of preaching from 1 Peter, I have been giving you some uh, certain selection of events in Peter's life. I did that because I wanted you to understand who it is that's writing this letter. I wanted you to have some grasp of the way in which God had acted to, uh, to bring Peter to himself, to salvation, and how that shapes him and shapes then the letter that he writes to believers, believers in his day, but also believers throughout every age. For this is part of God's word, his scripture, that has in mind that it would have an enduring message. So it is not just for those pilgrims that Peter mentions here, but it is indeed for you. So today I'm going to take just these first two verses because they do identify who the letter is from. from. They also identify who the letter is to, but most importantly, they set out the theme of the letter. On the back of your bulletin, you'll see that written down as the uh, underneath the, the title of the sermon, Strangers in a Strange Land, really the theme of the letter that I want to set before you is that you are pilgrims in this world. And more than pilgrims, you are elected by the triune God. Therefore, live as strangers in a strange land. So we'll begin with who the author is. This letter is from Peter. Verse 1 introduces him, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Let me just briefly remind you of those certain events of his life that we have looked at and how that shapes this uh, shapes the, the, the author. Well, it started with, uh, with Peter coming to find Jesus. We, met, we came to know that Peter was a man of faith, that he was searching for the Messiah. And that promise led him to Jesus, and he rejoiced at having found Jesus, and he expressed the faith that that came to rest in Jesus boldly and clearly. He was the one who proclaimed to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And later, when others were deserting, Peter would say, well, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And his faith was clinging to that work of Jesus. The New Testament also presents Peter's failings and his sins. We found that like all genuine believers, that Peter's faith faltered in the faith faith of his own pride, isolation, and the fear of man. Not only did he falter, but he even denied knowing Jesus. We too were warned to be careful if you think you stand, lest you fall. 
But then the last event that I set before you last week was that very close, intimate conversation that Jesus had with Peter, the one who had denied him. But Jesus came to Peter. He restored him. He reminded him that Jesus himself had prayed for Peter, that his faith would not fail. And having restored him, he gave him a task. Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. Now, Peter would go on to be a bold servant of Jesus Christ. And as you read through the rest of the New Testament, you'll see that after Jesus ascended into heaven, that Peter became a visible and vocal leader of the church. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he stood and he preached on the day of Pentecost. He proclaimed the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all should come to believe in Jesus Christ. He he called all to come and, and believe in him, that by faith and repentance that they would receive remission of their sins. And he went on in the early church to steadfastly teach the doctrines, of the combined apostles, that he, he continued in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and prayers as Acts 2 describes. And it's thought then that Peter probably wrote this letter some 30 years after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. Just imagine that wisdom that the Lord gave to Peter through those early years, that time that he was with him physically, and then with him through the outpoured spirit of God and through the minister ministry that Jesus had given to him. And so as Peter looks at the church, Out of the wisdom and experience that he had had, he writes this letter, probably around the year A.D. 65. So that means that as you read this, you should hear it, understanding that this comes from one who walked and talked with Jesus. That this comes from one that had been commissioned by Jesus to tell of that experience. And he would know that, uh, know, uh, the, know the grace of God in some very powerful and important ways that came from his own denial of Jesus Christ. So he could speak of how the Lord saves, not based on our goodness, not based on our ability to hold on to Jesus Christ. He experienced that. And in this letter, he will draw that in and help you to understand that. But Peter also wrote based on the charge that Jesus had entrusted to him. Peter says, uh, or verse 1 says, this is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And that is a title that comes with a lot of meaning. The Lord Jesus had entrusted him, feed my lambs, tend my sheep. And so Peter wrote as one not only with experience, but he also wrote as one with authority. Authority given to him by Jesus Christ. I want to identify that because, uh, because authority is sometimes looked at as, as almost a, a dirty word these days. That we look with, uh, with suspicion at anyone who is in authority. Now, that doesn't mean that authority is without error and that there aren't questions that ought to be rightfully asked of those in authority. But authority in and of itself is not a bad thing. It is indeed something given by God. So the title, Apostle, refers to the responsibility that Jesus had given to Peter and the rest of the twelve. They were to be Christ's ambassadors. They were granted and given authority because they had been eyewitnesses of the ministry of Jesus Christ and especially of the resurrected Lord. 
You might remember that Peter was one that rushed to the tomb to see the emptiness there, to see that uh, that Christ was no longer dead. He had indeed seen the, the risen Jesus Christ. He had met with him, had talked with him, had eaten with him, and had been commissioned by him. And the task that Jesus gave to the apostles was to remember all those teachings, to proclaim the resurrected Jesus Christ, to take what he had taught, to to proclaim it, to explain it, to apply it, to write it. And that's what Peter is doing. Given his experience and given the humbling that Jesus had brought to Peter, there is a sense that comes through in what Peter writes. You find that he doesn't make himself the center of attention. But Peter also didn't shy away from that authority that was given to him. He was an apostle. He had been entrusted with the words of life. And so he takes on that leadership and that role with humility and confidence. He looks to Jesus as the head of the church. Having seen who wrote the letter then, let's look to whom he wrote. The first part of the, of the address, we might say, of this letter reads like this. To the pilgrims. And uh, that's what I'm going to focus on here, to the pilgrims, the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. What is a pilgrim? A pilgrim is a, is a traveler. A pilgrim is one who is, is passing through. There is a sense of being a temporary resident to the idea of being a pilgrim. Some translations use the root word here to say that we are strangers. That's one meaning of that word. We are, are strangers. And that doesn't mean strange in a, in a modern sense as being weird. Uh, rather, it has in mind the idea of, of not being common or, not, uh, uh, or, or being a sojourner here in this land. You might think about the book Pilgrim's Progress. That's what our adult Sunday school is going through right now. There, the author John Bunyan describes that journey of the Christian life, how we are pilgrims. We are on the road to the celestial city, heaven. But there is a, uh, there's a, there's a journey, and it has a sense that as a believer of God, that you are in the world and your citizenship is still here, but you have another citizenship. You have a heavenly citizenship in heaven. You are a citizen of the city of God while you still live here. So when Peter calls you a pilgrim, he has in mind shaping your understanding of the life that you are living, that it is shaped by the fact that you belong to God, that you are following after Jesus Christ. The rest of the letter is going to unpack that, and I look forward to doing just that. But even today, you can begin to meditate on what it means to be a pilgrim. You might ask yourself today, as you, as you think about these words, or you might ask your family as you sit down to supper tonight, you might ask, what does it mean to be a pilgrim? How does it give you hope in the midst of the trials that you go through? How does it shape your values? How does it shape the way you spend your time and your resources? Ask yourself what it means to be a pilgrim. But in this address, you'll also see that it is given to those who were dispersed, to the pilgrims of the dispersion. What Peter's talking about here is that there was a scattering of the New Testament church. This happened fairly soon after Jesus' 
ascension into heaven. There was the gathering of the church at Pentecost. There was a gathering of the Jews to celebrate the Passover. And they heard the gospel. And there were many who believed and came to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they went to their homes, back to these far-flung countries where they had been dispersed earlier. Back in the Old Testament, when Israel and Judah sinned against the Lord, they were dispersed. There were remnants of the Jewish people that were in these far-off countries. But there was another dispersion that happened. Because as the gospel took hold in Jerusalem, the, uh, the Jewish leaders worked against them and persecuted the church. You might remember that, that Saul, who later became Paul, was one of the chief persecutors. He had been given authority to hunt them down, to put them in prison, to take them to trial. And some even went to their death. And so by persecution, there was a scattering again. And as the church was scattered, they took the gospel with them. That's a fascinating aspect of the New Testament church, that out of persecution, the church was, was planted around uh, all around the Mediterranean, around the known world. See, God was sending them out with the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. In this case, as Paul wrote to those who were scattered, it, uh, it is to nations or to locations that really aren't very significant from the world's point of view. And the numbers were of numbers of those who are scattered. It's not a significant, powerful group that he is writing to. But the people he wrote to were significant. Do you know why? Because they were Jesus' sheep. And I hope when I say it that way, you will remember what Jesus said to Peter. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord. I, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs. So Peter was writing to Jesus' sheep. And since the Lord Jesus loved them, Peter loved them too. And he gave his life to the living task of feeding them, of tending them, of nurturing their faith in Jesus Christ, especially in the midst of their trials. So he wrote to the pilgrims. But next, he also wrote to those who are identified as the elect. And I want to expand on this. In your outline, you see from Peter to the pilgrims and now to the elect. This is the third point. I want to expand it because it really does set in front of you what the... Uh, what the theme of the rest of the letter is. That you are pilgrims in this wor world, elect by the triune God, therefore live as strangers in a strange land. So Peter says he writes to the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. What Peter does is in this simple phrase is to set out the unsearchable, unsearchable mystery of the Trinity. Did you hear? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three captured in this very simple phrase. And you might breeze over it as something that is, is merely a description of who uh, Peter is writing to, but buried in it is a treasure. A treasure because it ties you 
to every person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I want to show you how. We'll start with the Father's plan. You are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Election is a rich doctrine. It is a word that the Bible uses to describe God's sovereignty to choose a people to himself to save sinners out of the power and the dominion of Satan. It is God and God alone who can do that. He does it based on his love, not based on anything in us. So when the text says that you are elected according to his foreknowledge, you need to understand that, that it is a foreknowledge that is based on his choice, not based on anything that we might do. And I say that because foreknowledge and election and predestination, all words that the Bible uses are ones that are, are difficult for us to understand. From our perspective, which is limited, limited because we're creatures and limited because of our sin. From our perspective, we hear the gospel, we repent, we ask Jesus to save us. And our perspective seems to say that we choose God. So what do we do with those biblical terms of election, predestination, and foreknowledge? Well, what Peter does without explanation is to talk from God's perspective to talk from what God does that, uh, that shapes then our perspective. And what is it that God does? Well, the Father, from all eternity past, has planned to save sinners. God, in his wisdom, has determined that he would not leave sinners to be doomed forever, as he justly might do. Instead, he is full of grace and he is full of mercy. And to demonstrate that, he has chosen to save sinners. And it is a glorious doctrine for us to understand. We can only scratch the surface of this. And like I said, Peter uh, speaks of it without explanation and does so so that you would understand your pilgrimage in this life. And connecting election and pilgrimage will strengthen you on the journey that you are on to the celestial city. For if your pilgrimage depends on your ability to persevere, you will falter and fail. Just think about how many times in Bunyan's book that happens to Christian and faithful and hopeful. They get knotted up and tangled in their own temptations. Think of your own pilgrimage. Think of the history of your path, of how Christ has opened your eyes to your sin and has brought you in humility to cry out, oh God, save me. And how that path has been up and down and up and down. You are a pilgrim elect by God. That election breathes hope into the path that you are walking. You, as a believer, you, as a church, have been chosen by God. That sets you apart from the world. That sets you apart to to belong to God. And 
in your pilgrimage, you can look to the Father who has indeed planned to bring salvation to you. And you can pray according to that promise. So God, keep what you have promised. Keep what you have planned. And you can stand on that promise. And on that pilgrim journey, you can look forward to seeing him face to face. Not because of your strength, but because of God's eternal wisdom and providential choosing. Secondly, look at the Holy Spirit's application of that plan of God. Peter, once more, without explanation, talks of the mystery of the Trinity and the mystery of election, two great mysteries in the Christian life. He says, you are elect in the sanctification of the Spirit. And in saying that, he's demonstrating how the Holy Spirit, a distinct person of the Trinity, is active in your salvation. In this case, in your election as well. From all eternity past, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has been determined together to save sinners. And it is the Father who plans, and it is the Spirit who applies that. The Father calls you to Christ by his Spirit. That calling has the effect of sanctifying you. And that's a word that has in mind how God sets you apart from sin and the world. And there's that pilgrim idea again. And sets you apart to God, to holiness. This helps us understand the doctrine of election again in another important way. Some would object to election as if it teaches that God chooses irregardless of your holiness. It sets up something of a straw man and says, there are people who will go to heaven who hate God, who never were converted because they're only there because God chose them. That's the way they would paint election. But that's not the biblical idea. God chooses for a purpose. His election has, has reason and has a destination for you. God calls you to himself, saving you from your sins, delivering you out of that, and saving you in the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. Well, that means that in your pilgrim journey, you can look to the Spirit to be be stirring you up in that sanctification. You can look to the third person of the Trinity himself who dwells in you to give you strength to resist the temptations, to know that he has delivered you from them that they no longer have a binding power over you. You can know that, that you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, not to Satan and not to this cursed world and its habits. You can nurture this by praying that the Holy Spirit would nurture your connection to our triune God to strengthen your resolve, to deepen your understanding of the privilege of your status as a child of God. You can pray that he would enable you more and more to die to sin and more and more to be like Christ. Which brings us to the third person. Uh, Careful of my terms here. Uh, It brings us to Jesus. I'll just say it that way. We speak of Jesus as the second person of the Trinity, but it's, it's third here in the outline and third in Peter's, Peter's words. It is the son's accomplishment that is in view here. We are elect, in the words of Peter, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. 
And I found in just meditating on this phrase that, uh, that this phrase has, has an application to the accomplishment of our redemption as well as the living out of that redemption in our lives. So think of what Jesus has done to accomplish your salvation. And again, in the context of election, think of all eternity past, that in the counsel of the triune God that the Father planned and the Son covenanted to accomplish that redemption. The Spirit applies that. The Son agreed to be our mediator. The Son said that he would become man. He would take on body and blood and a a reasonable soul. He would be fully man so that he could do what? He could obey for you and he could die for you. You are elect for obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. There's that accomplishment of what Jesus does. Jesus obeyed for us. That's his active obedience. He died for you. That's his passive obedience. His suffering for you. Jesus is your mediator. And he agreed to do that when he became man. What a blessing that we have the Lord's Supper today to to come right along beside that to remind us. But the phrase has more in mind. It has in mind as well that the work of Christ is connected to a pilgrim journey. The Father chose us in Christ before time that we might walk in obedience. Think of what Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 describe. It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that we might walk in them. This connects us back to the Holy Spirit and the sanctification. For in Christ, he sets you free to obey yourself and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ. And here, the sprinkling evokes the memory of the consecration that happens throughout the Old Testament rites. Think of the priests that were consecrated through the sprinkling of blood consecrated to serve, consecrated to follow. And so it's a phrase that has in mind the accomplishment of Jesus Christ that then enables you as a pilgrim to obey, to consecrate, to be consecrated, to follow after him. I like the way that uh, an author, Ryan McGraw, talks about this in Experiencing the Trinity. He says, Christ makes a Christian. We know that we are elected by the Father and sanctified through the Spirit by our faith and obedience toward Christ. That leads to believing what he tells us. It leads to being willing to do what he commands you. Those are questions that you can can mull on today as you think about being a pilgrim. Do you believe what he tells you? Are you willing to do what he commands you? Will you do so because you are a child of God? The pilgrim, elect by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Paul brings his opening statements to an end with a blessing. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Similar words appear in most of the apostolic letters of the New Testament. We've come to call them an apostolic greeting. In fact, 
I use similar language as we start our worship service. I say to you, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You'll find those words in a variety of those letters. But in this context, I hope you'll see that it's more than just a greeting. It's not as if as if Peter begins his letter like we always do. Uh, Dear church in Galatia and, and everywhere else, sincerely, Peter. That's not what he's doing. He is pronouncing a blessing. As an apostle of God, he's, he is, is proclaiming peace. He is proclaiming mercy and grace. It comes from our triune God. Throughout this pilgrim journey, you will follow after Christ because of his love, because of his mercy. You can trust in our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who has promised he will indeed accomplish what he has promised, and he will give you the grace to do what he has called you to do. That grace and peace is multiplied. Peter will pick up that term again, pick up that idea again at the close. And this is the benediction that I'll be using through this series of messages. Hear these and, and be meditating on them. I'll use them again at the close of the service. May the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered for a while, perfect Establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, you are pilgrims on a journey. You are elect by the Holy Spirit. So live as strangers, live as pilgrims, sojourners with a citizenship in heaven, here in this world, but not of it, strangers, in a strange land. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the love and plan of our Father. We thank you for the fellowship and communion, the sanctifying work of our, our of the Holy Spirit that you have given to us. We praise you, O God, that we can look to you And know that our redemption is secured in heaven based on your triune love administered in Christ, applied by the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Psalm 84 is a pilgrim song. It talks about journeying to appear before the face of God. We'll be singing this in in association with the Lord's Supper, but... Think as well as the pilgrim journey and the nourishment that the Lord gives you along the way so that we will indeed appear one day before the face of God. Stand and sing Psalm 84a.